Welcome everyone to the MCIT Online Admissions Webinar for April. Um, my name is Rafia Foster. I'm the Admissions Coordinator for MCIT Online. Thank you for joining us. We are excited to have you here today to hear from our Program Director and Dean um, for MCIT. And we're going to give it about a minute or so for people to join us as we see the, the numbers increase of people joining us. And then we'll start. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A tool, which should be at the bottom of your screen or for some of you at the top, uh, instead of the chat function. So we'll be answering questions through the Q&A. You'll also have an opportunity to upvote any questions that you might have. Uh, towards the end of the session, we'll be answering questions that have come up pretty often so you can have more insight about the program. Um, and let's see. And so once again, thank you for joining us. Hello to all of you joining us. Hello, Josh. And Akiro, Amandir, and Thomas. You guys are all so wonderful and welcoming to each other. This is really nice. And Boone and Tom, I don't know if you can see this, but they're all saying hello to each other in the chat. But remember the Q&A tools for any questions you might have. Hello from France and Virginia and North Carolina, somewhere nice and warm. Um, so it's great that this webinar is about, you know, the curriculum, the coursework and the community. So you guys are already getting together with the community function right now, which is really um, wonderful. So we will start. Let's see. So first and foremost, once again, thank you for joining us. And I'll give you some insight into the program just in general. So MCIT Online has been on campus for about 19 years now. So it's been a program that has been on campus here at Penn for quite some time. And the School of Engineering saw an opportunity to widen uh, the growth of the program by exploring online options. So this is something that has been in effect for two years. So this we just had our second birthday um, this past year, um, which is which is very important. We were excited about that. And MCIT Online is specifically a degree that's designed for people without a computer science background. So those students that don't have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in computer science. Um, so we have people from a wide variety of backgrounds. So, you know, philosophy, psychology, history, economics, finance, um, you know, people who are lawyers, medical school, dentists, lots of different uh, areas of interest, um, people that come from a theater background and music as well. Uh, and the knowledge that you gain is the same type of knowledge that you would get from a master's in computer science degree. MCIT Online is its own unique credential. Uh, but you gain the same knowledge from MCIT online. And often a question we get is what kind of diploma do I get? Is it an online diploma? Is it something that is accredited as well? We are fully accredited um, underneath the University of Pennsylvania, but you get the same exact diploma um, as our on-campus students. And the coursework and rigor is identical to our on-campus program as well. So when you receive your degree and your diploma, there's no mention that it's online. There's no mention that it's online on transcripts as well. Oftentimes that's a concern, um, but it's the same degree in the same program. Our curriculum. So our total curriculum is 10 courses. We have six core courses that students have to complete in addition to four elective courses that they can choose in order to graduate from the program. So the elective courses, there's a wide range that you'll hear about those a little bit later, um, but you could use those electives to kind of customize and specialize in different areas of interest that you might have. The six core courses are used to kind of build the foundational skills in computer science that you'll need to be successful going forward in the program. So there's kind of an order of the courses and there's prereqs that you would need to take before you take certain electives or certain courses, but that's all really outlined um, online in our in our website underneath uh, the course description uh, tab. 
program pacing. So this has a lot to do with the flexibility of the program, which I think is wonderful and, and one of the highlights of our program as well. So you could either be a full-time student or a part-time student. As you see there, part-time is one to two courses a semester and full-time is three or four courses a semester. And based on how you decide to structure uh, the program, you could finish it anywhere from five semesters or seven semesters, it's really up to you. There's some people that will take one class at first, then switch and take two classes the next semester, then switch back to one, or you could take three. Um, the program is designed to be flexible for people that are working professionals or people that might have other things that um, come up, you know, life circumstances. Um, you're also able to defer for a semester or a year if you're admitted or and enroll in the program and if necessary, take a leave of absence for a semester. So you have a total time of 40 months to complete the program, which is usually equivalent to about seven years. So the flexibility is up to you as well. And this talks a little bit about the community. So oftentimes people ask, how do you engender a sense of community in an online program? And what is the structure like? And so um, once again, you'll hear more about that later, but there are weekly or bi-weekly lectures. Um, all those are pre-recorded. Uh, for you to watch at your leisure so you can watch them anytime based around your schedule. Um, we have a really robust online community, which is great. And as you could see from your uh, activity in the, the chat, um, it's easy to kind of to gain some sort of traction and meet other people and, and engage with each other online um, more so than people typically think. Um, we have tailored career services specifically for MCIT online students. Sometimes people ask, you know, how do you do career services? Are there career fairs, et cetera? We actually had a, a virtual career fair for our students and there are oftentimes bi-weekly um, seminars with our career services team and professional networking. And students are also eligible for federal financial aid um, if they're US citizens or permanent residents. Uh, so that helps with the affordability of the program. And this picture right here I'd like to point out is one of our in-person meetups that we had before the pandemic um, out in California with some of our students and our Associate Director of Professional Networking. Application details. So this is application season for MCIT Online. The early cycle application is closed already. Um, for those of you who applied already and are awaiting your decision, you'll hear on April 15th. I'll start by saying that. Um, for those of you that are still in the application process, um, there are certain steps that you have to take. So you'll need to submit your resume, your personal statement, college transcripts from every school that you've attended, even if you have transfer credits from another school. Um, you're also going to need to submit the application fee two letters of recommendation. You have an optional third letter of recommendation that you could also submit. Uh, the GRE and the GMAT is optional, and it's something that can help strengthen your application if you decide to submit those scores. And for students where English is not the first language or their language of instruction of their college or university was not English, you'll be required to take the TOEFL or complete a TOEFL waiver in order to have a complete application. In order to kind of keep track of the self-managed application, there's a checklist uh, in the application portal that'll give you an idea of the things that you're still missing and the things that are necessary um, to complete your application. You're also able to submit um, something to the people writing your recommendations to, as a reminder to let them know to submit all of the material on time. In order to have your application considered for the regular cycle admission where the deadline is May 1st, you're gonna to need to have all of your application material submitted to us by May 1st. Sometimes people will ask really specific questions. That would be May 1st, 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is the cutoff for making sure that you have all of your documents, documents sent to the portal and in our office. Um, and then you just need to verify that we have everything that we need. You'll also get an email back letting you know that your application is complete and ready to be reviewed by the admissions committee. If you're admitted to the program, you'll be required to submit all of your official transcripts from all of the schools that you originally submitted your transcripts from. Um, during the evaluation process, we just need your unofficial college transcripts. But if you're admitted and enroll, you'll need to arrange to send your official transcripts to our offices as well. And looking ahead, once again, the deadlines. May 1st is the regular cycle application deadline. Decisions are returned on June 15th for regular cycle applicants. The deposit is due on July 15th. And onboarding, which is kind of the beginning of the program for some people that would be considered like pre-course work and um, 
getting other information from the student affairs team, that starts on July 19th and your first class would officially start on August 30th. Tuition and fees. Uh, affordability is also another hallmark of MCIT online. And for tuition, we don't charge per semester, we charge per course unit. Each class is one course unit, so you pay per class. So for instance, if you decide to use the flexibility of the program fully and take one class, you would pay for that one class. If you decide to take two classes a semester, you would pay for those two classes back and forth. And the total tuition approximately is about $25,000 a year. And the, the payment schedule will, will depend on how many classes you take a semester like we mentioned before. And now I'd like to introduce our two panelists, Boon Tao Lu, who is the Associate Dean of Graduate Programs for the School of Engineering, and Tom Farmer, who is the Program Director for MCIT Online. And first, we will hear from Boon. Right, thank you, Rafia. It's a great pleasure to see everyone. I'm uh, really heartened to see so many of you here and also a lot of great questions being asked. Um, please keep the questions coming. Uh, I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate Programs where I oversee the, um, all the masters and PhD programs within School of Engineering. I'm also a professor in the Computer Science Department where I um, have an active research program. But most importantly, I'm also an instructor for MCIT Online. Uh, I've been at Penn uh, since 2007 and started teaching online since MCIT launched. And it has been one of the highlights of my time at Penn. I really enjoy meeting and interacting with all the online students, um, many of whom have very um, inspirational stories on how they got started to uh, you know, pursue further education. And I think this is the program that's really making a difference in the lives of many people. I'm really, really honored to be a big part of it. Um, so uh, very briefly also, apart from my academic work, I've also been a entrepreneur. I founded companies and uh, sold them successfully in the past. And uh, I'm also uh, proud to know that I'm from Southeast Asia and have uh, worked and studied in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area before moving to the East Coast. Now, one of the nice thing about being associate dean and faculty member is I get to travel and pre-pandemic had the opportunity to actually go around the world, um, different parts of Asia, West, different parts of the United States, and got a chance to meet many of the um, MCIT online students wherever they are and uh, certainly hope to resume that post pandemic. And uh, yeah, so I, I guess at this point, I will, um, uh, yeah, so I got my degree from Berkeley and so on. Anyway, I'm sure all of you have heard enough about me. So let's talk about MCIT curriculum and electives. So as Rafia mentioned just now, we have six core classes and many of you may have come in without much, uh, if anything at all, training in computer science and do not worry about it. The six core classes are carefully designed and tailored to help you get up to speed and then you can do all the um, other fun stuff uh, in the electives uh, after that. And um, as we develop MCIT online, we are always launching and starting new electives. And this is the list of electives that we have currently. And the good news is by the time you guys are through the core classes, this list is going to grow even more, right? And to give you some example of, uh, we have a, a cluster of classes that's generally in the machine learning uh, data science space. And this would include uh, classes in um, applied machine learning, in mathematical foundations in machine learning. And that's actually a key one, right? We don't we not only teach you how to apply machine learning techniques, but we also teach you the mathematical foundations in machine learning. So the next time after you graduate, you may be able to come up with new machine learning algorithms and, and innovate in that space. Um, and more on the applied side, we have computer vision, right? Today, if you look at self-driving cars, it's really not only driven by the AI, uh, but also driven by the computer vision that's recognizing images and so on. Uh, we have um, recently launched an intro to robotics class, 
Um, and actually, this is taught by our Dean Vijay Kumar himself, who is one of the world leading experts in robotics. Um, and uh, if you kind of move adjacent to machine learning, there is a databases, you know, where you learn about how uh, databases are built. And this is not a class that just teaches you about SQL and web applications. You actually get to learn the internals of how, let's say, you know, Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle database work, right? How the database engine is developed. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and we also have another cluster of systems classes and that involves things like uh, mobile communications, internet of things, software analysis is also a really important and big topic, right? Today, if you look at software, uh, there's potentially security issues, software bugs and so on. And one of the key techniques heavily used in industry is to do proper software testing and analysis so that you could uncover these bugs and make your software more secure. Um, and last but not least, we have a class on blockchains and cryptography. And this is a really awesome class because in order to learn about blockchains, you have to learn how communication networks work. You have to learn about database transactions. You have to learn about cryptography, right? And this is a class that really brings together a lot of concepts in a cross-cutting way across many areas of computer science and then having very state-of-the-art applications in you know, cryptocurrency, in supply chain management and so on. And, and, uh, and, and I'm sure by the time you get past the core classes, this list is going to grow. And I would last add very important thing is a lot of these classes are taught by the same faculty on campus, right? So it's the same faculty, same high quality Ivy League education that you're getting um, through this online program. So that's all I have to say. I'll hand it back to you, Rafia. Thank you, Boone. That was so helpful. Um, and now we'll hear from Tom Farmer, who is a professor at MCIT online and also the program director. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. And thank you, Rafia, for the introduction. So I was just going to tell you a little bit about myself and then try to tell you a little bit about uh, the way the courses are formatted. Um, so i give you a little bit about my background. Before I came to Penn, I, uh, after college, I graduated with my computer science degree and I worked for, as a programmer at AT&T Labs for about seven years. And when I was there, I uh, wanted to do my master's degree. So um, I was lucky that AT&T was willing to pay for my master's degree. And so they, they, they let me do that as long as I did it at night and it didn't interfere with my, 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 my work. And so I was very lucky to have that happen. So maybe like many of you, you're coming, you're working, you know, full time and you're, you know, going to be working on this degree part time. I fully understand that. In 2002, online learning wasn't what it was as it is now. So there was a lot more driving involved <laughs> in my degree. Um, but uh, without the commute, I can't even imagine how much more productive I would have been. So I'm excited for all of you. This is this is such a wonderful program because it kind of alleviates a lot of the pain points of going back for school while you're working full time. Um, you know, and a lot of people, you know, then tell me, why did you go back for a PhD or ask me why I went back for a PhD? After I got my master's, I was still working at AT&T. And even though I loved writing, uh, you know, software, I, uh, I decided that uh, that was no longer going to be my, my primary thing. So what I did was I wanted to go back for my PhD. So I quickly asked my girlfriend to marry me. <laughs> then I quit my job. That was probably the right order. Um, and then I sold all my belongings. <laughs> I moved to Washington, D.C. to attend the George Washington University down there and go back for a PhD full time. I was 27 years old at that point, so I was an older student. But I thought I brought a unique perspective like I think many of you will probably bring uh, to our courses as well. And then I finished uh, my PhD about 2010, and I went on for a postdoc fellow uh, doing research in RFIC. So I switched considerably from computer science to computer engineering. And so I love, you know, both of those things. I love the software. I love the hardware. The hardware is, you know, inspired me a bit to go back to school. Um, and after I did my postdoc, I learned a lot about um, uh, 
uh, RF IC integrated circuits that handle um, like wireless communication signals and a lot about computer architecture in that time, uh, especially in my education as well. Um, and then I joined Penn in 2012 and I actually ended up in both departments, the CIS department and the ESE department. So I get the best, best of both worlds, hardware and software. And so I teach a lot of undergraduate courses in the electrical engineering department. Um, about hardware and I teach in the computer science department about software and I think I'm properly positioned because I have that dual background and you'll feel that the course that hopefully you'll take under me which is CIT, uh, CIT 593 is a mix of those two things. We start out with a lot of the hardware. How does a CPU work? What's inside a you know, CPU? What, what are transistors? You know things that you may have always been curious about. And then we move up to software and how software interacts with all that hardware. So this is the kind of stuff that I just love. So that when, when I was asked to, to make a course uh, for MCIT Online, I was delighted to do that because it could combine both of my passions. Um, I joke, I have two daughters. They're not named hardware and software. <laughs> They're named Eleanor and Molly, but I do love those two things very much. Um, and, and I hope that it comes through when you take my course. Um, uh, CIT 593. So I was asked also to tell you a little bit about the course format. Um, and since I teach a course and, and, and um, uh, you know, you have, uh, I have a lot of insight into how other courses get taught too. Um, the main uh, format that you'll see is that all courses are, you know, broken into modules, right? Usually it's, um, you know, one module per week and modules will include things like video lectures. Uh, so all lectures are recorded in advance. Um, they're also uh, supplementing supplementary readings, assignments within the module. Um, and even within the course, there are, you know, discussion forums to help you uh, work through each module. Each module itself has, you know, homeworks that are associated with it, readings that are associated with it, um, and then certainly some quizzes and, you know, assignments, and in some cases, group uh, assignments as well. So it's, it's um, you know, you can do the modules as you wish, but they're in sync per the week, right? So each week we're all moving through the course together. Um, but again, you can use your free time, uh, you know, outside of work or just when you have free time, uh, to go ahead and get through those modules. So it's it's nice in that way. It's very flexible in that sense. Um, of course, the course itself is 15 weeks in length. So, you know, in 15 weeks, you'll be done with the course. Um, but again, there's there in some in some courses, there are exams uh, in uh, midterms and final exams. I know that in CIT 593, my course, that's exactly how we do it. Um, it's very nice though, if you need support during the week, we have a lot of teaching assistants and each teaching assistant has office hours via Zoom. So you can come on and, you know, get help pretty much anytime you need. And certainly each instructor has office hours as well. So you can come to office hours of the instructor if you like and get questions answered. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice format. It's, it's really much geared to the online learner as opposed to the on-campus learner. So everything is really tailored to you guys. And um, I think that you'll like it. I think the students we have now love it. And the, you know, we, every semester, if we find another way to improve the course, we add something to the, to the, to the course to make it even better. Um, one thing I also wanted to answer or, you know, a question that I'd like to answer is that people ask, how do you take the exams remotely? Uh, and so one thing that we have like an online proctoring service. So you, you have, you know, a window of time by which to take the exam, maybe like a week. You schedule when your exam is ready for you to take. And then you sit, you sit down for maybe like two hours or something like that, depending on the course and the exam length, take the exam and you uh, submit online. So it's it's a pretty clever, you know, way to put everything together. You don't, you know, you're always working through an online uh, system and uh, it works pretty well. So I think that's everything I can think of about it. So Rafi, if I've left anything out, please let me know. No, no, perfect. So um, one of the things I wanted to mention were Slack and Piazza, if you can explain a little oh, bit. Oh, yes, about thank you for that. that so, um, in terms of being able to ask questions, obviously you have the opportunity to do it through office hours, but we also have a messaging board called Piazza. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. Um, it's a, a place where you can ask questions um, 
uh, with your name on it or even anonymously, which is kind of nice. So if you have one of those questions that you just <laughs> feel like it's not the best question to ask, you go right ahead and ask it. And it's sort of a crowdsourced uh, way of answering a question. So if other students know the answer, they go ahead and jump in and help. Uh, instructors can kind of say yes or no to that answer. And certainly instructors and teaching assistants can also help answer the questions. Um, and we often do when, you know, maybe questions are just not answerable by other students. Um, and the other mechanism that we have is a Slack channel um, for, you know, for each course. And then we also have a Slack channel for the program as well, um, where you can, you know, ask questions there as well and ask questions of each other. You know? So it's, it's a lot of nice ways to get in touch with us. Um, and it kind of is a nice way to strengthen a community of the class. So you kind of feel like you're in it together with your fellow students um, with all these nice online uh, learning activities or, or learning you know, avenues to ask questions and get answers. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. And now I'll talk a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit about the MCIT online community, which um, is very, very strong. So just to give you an idea of some of the demographics, we have around 46 countries represented, and that number seems to grow um, every year with every cohort, uh, which is wonderful. Um, we have about 45 US states and territories represented right now. And we have students from a wide variety of ages. So anywhere from 20 to 70 years old, sometimes people will um, come to admissions office hours and say, oh, I think I might be a little bit too young for the program, or I might be a little bit too old for the program. And I'd like to say there's a very, very, very wide range um, of ages and, and students and, and range of experience as well, which is really nice. So you're able to learn from other people um, in the program. Uh, the student affairs team has also built a wonderful student mentoring program, uh, which I think is, is admirable and a, and a really nice way to build community among people that might be in different points of their career, people that are looking to pivot to a different area as well. And we're also proud of, proud of our gender diversity, specifically in computer science with 37% women and 63% um, men at this point in time. Would you like to, Tom or Boone, add anything specifically about demographics as well, or in general? I can give some anecdotal evidence. <laughs> I don't have any statistics to add, but uh, you know, I've had a lot of students in my MCIT 593 course, and some have been, you know, physicians, which is always sort of, you know, surprising to me <laughs> to see a, a, a person that's far more well educated than I, which is lovely, but they're just there to learn and they don't know anything about computer science. So it's perfect. You know, they're in the right place at the right time. I've had students that are just, you know, not too far out of college and they're just coming back. I've had people that have been working for 20 years coming back and it's just a nice, diverse community with people that have just amazing different, you know, unique backgrounds, you know, people that have degrees in philosophy and just all sorts of different things that make the course very interesting and it makes it so i love coming to office hours because i get to meet people that are not only all over the world but also have these you know amazing backgrounds so the statistics are fantastic and it gives you insight but when you actually get into the class you'll really meet a lot of different people that have uh, just remarkable backgrounds so that part is that's that's all i think i could add i, th I think it really adds to the richness of the program being able to have people from such a wide um, area, not just geographically, but in different points of their career, different ages, different ethnicities, different genders. Um, and you're able to build a community that you might not have been able to build in other ways. Um, oftentimes, uh, sometimes people ask, you know, oh, I'm in Japan. There probably aren't any people in Japan that will meet up during office hours for me. And I say, no, we actually think about time zones when developing things for courses in the program because there are a group of people from different time zones. So everything that's done in the program is so intentional in terms of making sure that it's inclusive um, on how we how we arrange meetings, how we arrange office hours, how we arrange, you know, times for proctored exams, et cetera. All of that is very, very um, thought out ahead of time, um, simply because we have so people from such a wide range. And excuse me, I have a little person coming home. <laughs> Mine are just outside that door, so I totally understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I just want to add that, you know, I've had office hours where at the same time we had students from Asia, Europe, and the US all together. It's really cool. 
And I think a lot of our students continue to inspire us. We have students with family, with kids, my TAs included, and I'm, I'm always very impressed how everyone could you know, manage their time and still do so well in classes. Great. And then we also have opportunities um, outside of Slack for students to work together and get to know each other really well. So um, if you're admitted and enrolled, there is a private MCIT online LinkedIn group, which is very active um, to kind of like share resources and, and articles and kind of network and meet other students that are in the program. Um, we also have a wonderful student association. So it's called MOSA, MCIT online. They actually have their own website. Um, simply because they're computer science students. They were like, we're gonna build a website and we're gonna get this all streamlined, which is wonderful. Um, and they have all different types of committees that you can join the social and fellowship committee, education committee, marketing committee, mentorship committee, lots of different resources. Um, they arrange for um, hackathons, for uh, internship opportunities. They have a resume database. So although the program is online, there is really truly a sense of community um, because people are always willing to pitch in and help each other out or share resources that they have, which I think is, is absolutely wonderful. And there's one other thing that I think is, is worth mentioning as well. So school is very much, very much about academics, but there's also the social aspect too. One of the other nice things about, about the Slack channels that they have for students, they have the Slack channels for the coursework. So for 591, 593, et cetera. But they also have Slack channels for kind of off topic things. Like I really enjoy online gaming in my spare time, or um, I love student affairs team told me there's one called the Turtle Club. And the Turtle Club is specifically for students that are taking one course at a time. You know, I'm sure there were students thinking, I'm gonna be the only one just kind of going slow through their program, but there were enough of them <laughs> that they have their own Slack channel. And so they kind of work together. I'm gonna to take this class next. Who else wants to take this class next? So we can meet up together and study and maybe we can do group projects because we know each other from the Turtle Club. Um, so it's it's a really a nice range. Um, there's always lots of pictures of people's families. We have MCIT online baby onesies for, for those people that are expectant parents. So although the program is online, you would think that um, people were kind of meeting and talking with each other every day, which is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Tom or Boone? I think um, that's good for now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I can add, you, you did it all there. That was yeah. great. <laughs> it's, it's, re it's really great. And I think um, that's one of the wonderful things that is very much embedded into the culture of the program is a sense of community. You know, when talking about people, that's something that they often ask about. And that's something that I actually believe very strongly about that, you know, it is a very strong community, which is great. And now we have time for questions. So thank you for those of you that have been submitting questions in the Q&A tool. Um, we'll be able to answer some of them for you. So I will start with one um, that was asked earlier today, specifically, how are students able to gain a sense of community and have there been opportunities for students to meet up together um, at all? And, and what are plans for that? I'm trying to take that one. I. I mean, you did go over a couple of them already, which is great. You know, we have that Slack channel, which is fantastic for the for the entire program. We have the Slack channels for different uh, uh, courses. But as as far as actually, you know, getting to meet in person, um, there are uh, opportunities for that in the sense that anytime one of our faculty members, you know, goes on a trip, they uh, tend to try to, uh, you know, get together with any groups of students in the areas where they're going to just to, you know, meet you all and, and see if there's questions they can answer or just kind of, you know, foster a sense of community in, in the in the in the local area that they're that they're attending, um, which is fantastic. So that that does happen a bit. Um, I know Boone has done that many times, so he might be able to give you a little more information on, you know, his success with that. Um, but I've only ever heard good things about that. Myself, I wish I could travel a little more, but I've got the little ones at the moment, and so I don't do too much of it. Um, but that is one way. Other other things, as we've had, you know, students try to make their own 
sort of groups up and try to meet and we can help you with that right so if you're you know a new new cohort new group that's coming in and you're all sort of you know wondering you know we live in this area we'd all like to meet up can you help us and so we were very happy to help facilitate you know um uh, any way that you can you know sort of meet and and form and see and you know interact with your fellow students in mcit online and I think also on the Slack channel, there are also geographic areas for people of certain areas. And I remember um, meeting MCIT online students in LA, for example. And then subsequently, that was the first time a lot of students saw each other, but they thought, oh, you live in Orange County. Hey, you're over here and there. But then I know even though, you know, I met them once, they, they continue to get together and meet after that. So. And I think, you know, the, the nice thing about our program is on one hand it's geographically distributed. On the other hand, it's very likely wherever you are, you will find students in the program. And, and so, you know, students do self-organize and get together. And I'll also add that I've had a couple of students actually that just, you know, happened to be in Philadelphia during, you know, the academic year and they, they'd reach out to me and say, hey, could I, could I actually meet you in person? And that's delightful when that happens. So the answer there is always yes. And so I've met a couple of students just in person. And also I one time met a student in a coffee shop in a most remote area and they were looking at me like, I think, I think I know who you are. And then they came right up and they're like, I know you. And I was like, like I, I know your voice want to something. know you. <laughs> and it's a wonderful feeling. You know, it's just this surprisingly, uh, you know, spread out community, but there, there's a lot of um, togetherness in it. So it's, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. That's great. That's great. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I have another question. In addition to the computational thinking for problem solving course and the introduction and programming with Python and Java specialization, what other books and or resources do you recommend to prepare for the MCIT program and not simply the first course? Um, so maybe I'll try to take that and I'm sure Tom has a perspective too. Actually, Tom probably even have a better perspective because he teaches the third class in the sequence. Um, I, I would say that um, we assume students come in without much background and we really mean it in the sense that um, sometimes in the first class, uh, we can see some students knowing more than other students. But by the time you get to the fifth class, which is the one that I teach, I think pretty much everybody is on, on equal footing at that point. Um, but, you know, if you get admitted, it never, it always helps to watch the, the, the MOOCs that we have put out there. But all our classes are designed to be self-contained um, the, based on the lectures and the material that we provide. They should be sufficient for you to to, to, to get up to speed once you actually start taking the classes. And given that this is a program that's designed for students without any prior computer science background, we really designed the curriculum to, to make sure there is a gentle ramp up. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. Tom, did you have any suggestions? Yeah, sorry, I was, forgot I was muted there. <laughs> <laughs> to find the end um, but yeah um i i you know i, I as boone said I, I teach one of the you know first courses that you're going to take most likely and um you know i i have students that try you know that some want to prepare and they reach out ahead of time and they say is it possible to prepare for the class and and, and certainly there are ways to do it, but we are ready at whatever level you're coming in at. So we, we really try to get all the people with all the different backgrounds, you know, to a level playing field. So, you know, the, the course starts off slow and it kind of, you know, brings you into our computer science world. We, we start with the absolute basics to get you in. Um, and, you know, even if you're just doing the one course at a time, that's really understood in that sense. So, I, I wouldn't want to put a big pressure on anyone that says, oh my God, you got to get all these books and prepare for, for your way in. That, you know, we wouldn't have accepted you if we didn't think that you weren't ready to go uh, for the course. Certainly, you know, I think it's more fun to read anecdotal books in the sense of like the history of computing. You know, we don't have a course in it, but if you're kind of trying to feel where things fit in the context of, 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 um, 
you know, of, of, of time, that, that's a helpful thing. You know, it's kind of fun to go through that. I, I try to reference little bits of history as I go along in the course, um, you know, where I can, but that, that stuff always fascinates me. And it also helps, you know, put, put in, uh, you know, a context of, of what's going on. So, yeah, I don't think there's anything necessarily that you need to do to, to prepare specifically. Um, if it's been a long time since you've had algebra, you know, for your math classes, maybe brush up a little bit. But other than that, you know, I think you're, you're probably in good shape uh, in whatever state you come in. Perfect. Thank you. Next question. Looking at the classes offered, this appears to be coursework you would have taken in a Bachelor's of Computer Science. How are employers seeing this degree from a computer science perspective as a BS or an MS? So maybe let me try to take that question. Um, as you all know, this program is based on the MCIT on campus program, which has been around for um, many years. And um, we try to, so the core classes um, in most part map to some undergraduate coursework, but once you get to the electives, most of these electives are actually taken by master's students, even in the computer science um, master's program. And a lot of our students go on to get jobs in all the top tech companies you can think of, Google, Facebook, and, and so on. And in, in many ways from the industry um, point of view, um, what they really care about is your technical abilities during the interview. And that's where I feel like very proud to say that our students all do very well at that stage. Um, and I, I think most employers will not really with a fine comb differentiate between, you know, this degree versus a CS degree, but really how well you do during the job interview and um, also your subsequent um, job performance. However, I do want to mention that um, because there's four electives, um, that may also mean you need to be very strategic about choosing what electives you want to take. For example, if you know that after you finish the degree, you would like to pursue a career that's more in the data science space, um, then you, be, you should definitely focus more on classes in machine learning, databases, and so on. If, for, on, on the other hand, you want to go to, say, um, um, Google, Facebook, work on you know, backend infrastructure, more DevOps kind of thing, then you should focus more on the software systems electives. I think given that there are four electives, that's where you have to be a little bit strategic. And we'll be there to help you navigate this. We have an amazing student affairs team, um, some of whom are, are in those little squares that are answering your questions on the back end of the webinar as well. That really helps with advising and helping you plan your path throughout the whole program. Thank you. Uh, next question. Do you recommend to try learning a particular computer language before your first class? And can I add one thing here? We do have, for those of you who aren't aware of this, um, we do have two MOOCs that are wonderful. We have a computational thinking for problem solving MOOC through Coursera. And we recently launched another one, uh, the Python Java specialization, which are oftentimes helpful with kind of the initial onboarding and, and getting used to thinking um, in, a, in a systems way that will be helpful in computer science. So those are two options that you could pursue before you apply or before you start the program. And you could actually submit your certificate from those with your application for admission. And we'll look upon that favorably. But any other uh, suggestions, Tom or Boone? I wouldn't, I'm, as I teach a course, you know, where you're gonna learn how to program. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I don't think you have to go out and learn a programming language. I really do think, as you said, Rafia, those MOOCs are quite awesome um, in the sense that if you want a nice programming language to be introduced to, Python is a really good one. And, and that's, you know, helpful, not only from the perspective of just seeing how one of our online courses looks, you know, that kind of gets you used to it by taking that, um, but it also is, um, you know, a nice way to learn the language. So it's, 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 it's dual purpose, but I, I don't think that you have to learn a programming language beforehand, not at all. We're, we're going to teach you that. So don't, don't stress about that. Perfect. Um, yeah. What, one thing I want to add is a big difference between the MCIT program and say a 
vocational coding bootcamp is once you come out of this program, you learn the skill of picking up a new language quickly, right? If you go back to when Tom and I first started programming, we would tell you names of languages you've never heard of, right? I don't know if any one of you heard about Pascal. If not, don't worry about it, yeah. <laughs> right? But uh, what we learn over time is whenever there's a new language that comes up, we have the foundational skills that allow us to learn new languages easily. And we'll definitely teach you a lot of the, the skills to do that. We even have a, a dedicated class called Software Analysis, where you would actually learn about how compilers work, right? How your software goes from code to, to down to machine code and how the, your computer can manipulate the code to generate the, the, the target uh, machine representation that you want, right? And knowing how that works is so helpful because next time, 10 years from now, there may be a brand new language that none of us have seen before, right? But with the skills that you learn, you can really pick up new languages quickly. Thank you very much. Um, next question. What additional value can the program bring to a MD, a physician, who wants to be specialized in AI for medicine in both academic and commercial environments? That's a very specific question. Any thoughts? Uh, so so can, can you repeat this is a can you repeat the question or sure sure not a problem what additional value can the program bring to someone who's an md a physician um, who wants to be specialized in ai for medicine in both academic and commercial environments um, basically an, an idea of is this program something that would fit um, their interests and their their future goals for someone that might be a physician interested in AI um, in the healthcare technology field. That's great. Thank you so much for this question. First of all, I, I love doctors in my class. I, I think Tom mentioned he has came across one. I, I um, in, back back many years ago in my the second class that I taught at Penn, there was a seventy one year old retired doctor and and it was so inspirational to have him in class. So let me, let me, let me um, apart from intellectual curiosity, I think there are two kind of pathways to go with um, kind of um, medicine meets computer science. The first is in the general area of, um, I would say database applications, right? So if today a lot of the medical records are stored in uh, databases and um, the amount of data is big, and there's also a lot of privacy uh, type of uh, compliance requirements. So um, that involves you know, learning how to model data and to store them efficiently in a database. So certainly going to the program, there'll be electives to kind of steer you towards that direction. Um, but on the other hand, as you know today, uh, more and more uh, in the medical field, we are dependent on the use of machine learning to do uh, personalized uh, medicine, um, and even things down to scanning, you know, images of your body to detect possible, um, you know, concerns. That is actually a computer vision problem, right? So if you look at what computer vision is, it's one of the classes taught by uh, a professor, is one of the leading experts in this area. It's about making sense of an image, right? So for example, right now, I'm I'm in a I have a virtual image behind me if you haven't noticed, but how does Zoom differentiate me and my virtual image, right? That's a, a image segmentation problem in computer vision. And I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, medical imaging today really is driven by innovations in computer science. And last but not least in machine learning as well, right? You see today cross-cutting, not just in medical, but across all areas of engineering down to material science, bioengineering, and so on. Machine learning is becoming the new common language for all, right? It's kind of the tool that everybody needs in order to make sense of data, to do classification, prediction, and so on. So definitely there is a big, you know, um, I, I wouldn't say that at the end of the 10 classes, you're going to be the world expert in applying uh, medical to the medical area, but it certainly puts you in a really good, um, Kind of uh, foundations for that. Great, thank you, Boone. That was very thorough, and I learned something new about the Zoom background. Uh, the first time I saw Zoom, uh, Boone and Zoom, I said, "Oh, wow, you're in your office." And he said, "No, not really, <laughs> but it is his office." Um, 
I have another question for you. Are lecture videos newly recorded for years, talking about new trends and information, or are videos all the same for many years? I could try to get on, on that one. I mean, there the beautiful part is our online program is brand new, right? <laughs> In a sense. <laughs> so you have a bunch of brand new courses that have just been added. And at this moment, yes, everything is uh, brand spanking new. But um, as new trends pick up, one, you know, we're always looking into new electives that we could possibly add. So that's always one thing that can help address uh, that. Uh, and two, you know, yes, we update lectures. So if there are new you know, new things that need to be introduced or would be helpful for uh, for the course. We definitely, um, you know, uh, add new things uh, regularly. We update assignments to, you know, uh, take it or, you know, sort of introduce new things that can make use of the knowledge that you've learned in the course. So, yeah, the courses are evolving. They're not just stale and in a bin there. They really are something new and fresh every time a new cohort comes through. That even is the case for our MOOCs. Mm -hmm. So after the MOOCs are completed, there's a process where they review everything and, and look for any changes that might be necessary. So it's interesting. People sometimes think, oh, you should have electives much faster, but it takes about a year to develop each course. And then there's a period of time after those courses are completed where there are revisions if necessary or additions um, to the coursework. So it really is fresh and new, just like how technology is evolving and changing on a daily basis. Um, we want to make sure that you have up to date information and material and, and resources available at your disposal through the coursework as well. So I have one more other question. What type of jobs and careers does this program typically lead to? Um, so maybe I can take that and, and Tom uh, can as well. So I, I think this program is still fairly new. So we haven't yet graduated a, a, a lot of students, but uh, we, we can look at the on-campus MCIT program and that gives you a good um, ex, ex, kind of a example. So I would say it, it varies. There are, uh, there are students who love tech and want to go deep into hardcore tech. They go to uh, companies like Google, Facebook, but even then within those companies, we see a spectrum, right? There are those who stay at the application level. They write, you know, web applications, but they also students that I know who go on to work on uh, Chrome OS browser, the, you know, the backend uh, data center infrastructure type of work, right? So it's really across the spectrum. Um, but we have also seen MCIT students who are able to combine their existing interests before they came into the program with what they learned in the program. So I have came across students who uh, became very successful product managers. One of um, the alums uh, that I know well, and we actually featured her in as in an interview in my, my class. Um, she's now a product manager at Google. You can actually find videos of her giving product demos at YouTube. Now, that kind of thing, you really need to A, have very good interpersonal skills, presentation skills, able to connect with people, but at the same time, understand the technology, right? That's what you could get by combining whatever previous expertise you have, go through the program, and that's going to open up new avenues of uh, for career for you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned before was how strong our students do in technical interviews. And that's something that there are actually sessions for that um, through, through, through the student affairs team. So that's something that they understand the importance of that and make sure that, that students have plenty of opportunity um, to do mock interviews if necessary, which is great. The only thing yep. I would add, because I know Boone was asking me to add a little something there, was just uh, we, we definitely also noticed students making lateral moves, you know, so they mm -hmm. might have a job in a company that is hardware centric, but then they, you know, complete our master's degree and they move over to a software based, um, you know, uh, type job within. Maybe they become a programmer, you know, they start out in, in a different but, you know, equal position and start moving their way up the company in a different area. So that's one, just the only thing I would add in on that. Perfect. Thank you. We have time for one more question before we end. Uh, and, and keep in mind, please keep adding your questions to the Q&A uh, tool because after the seminar is over, we'll actually stay on for another 15 minutes and, and finish answering your questions. And you're also welcome to email us your additional questions as well. 
Um, but the last question, are there any on campus events and or access to campus resources for MCIT online students? Um, um, you want to take that or I could take that? I mean, you, you start, I'll, I'll finish, I guess. Oh, sure, okay. Yeah, so we, we pre-pandemic, we actually had events on campus where we brought together MCIT students. I, I think if I my memory remembers and Rafia, please correct me for homecoming mm -hmm. or the, we, we did bring together students from different- um, Yes, we did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and also uh, the a lot of the services that you will need from Penn are actually available for you remotely wherever you are. And I think that's that has even become more so in the midst of the pandemic and post pandemic as well. Um, but apart from that, yeah, I think regularly there are, there are events that uh, we hopefully will be able to do that again at some point um, on, on campus. Yeah, I, I wouldn't add much more to that, but I have seen, you know, stuff come, uh, events that have been on campus are the ones I'm more familiar with. So that does, happen throughout the semester and it's you know a lot of sometimes it's student organized sometimes it's us so it's there's a lot of chances and and students uh get a welcome packet in their first semester with mcit online t-shirt you get a student id if you need to come to the bookstore and buy um, books if you're in the area you're welcome to do that um, for a small additional fee, you could, you know, use the gym at Penn, you could go to the library if there's an amazing lecture that you want to attend on campus from a guest speaker, a distinguished speaker series on campus, and you happen to be in Philadelphia, you can use your Penn ID to come to that event. You're, of course, welcome to come to homecoming when it's um, back in person, and we even did a virtual homecoming this year. The student affairs team put that together, although we weren't able to be in person. Uh, and you're also invited to graduation. So when you complete the program, um, you know, for those of you that would be able to make it, you know, it'd be great to have you on campus for your formal graduation from the program as well. So you are able to use almost all the same resources as our on campus students, which is great, and access the vast alumni network as well of the University of Pennsylvania. So some people ask, how am I gonna meet other Penn students outside of MCIT in the program? Um, and I was saying there are Penn clubs almost everywhere. So you could find a little bit of Penn almost in every pocket um, of the world. So you can meet on campus um, once everything is clear and things are safer. Um, but you know, you have the same type of resources, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Perfect. So thank you, Boone and Tom for that engaging uh, discussion. I appreciate both of you for joining us today. Uh, and the last part is I'd like to invite all of you, if there are questions that weren't answered here, we have an amazing frequently asked questions database on our website where you could type in the search bar, um, any questions you have and, and get them answered easily there. You could also feel free to email us at online-learning at c's at upenn.edu. Um, oftentimes, if you email that address, I'm the one answering it. So if you have questions for, for me or Aaron or the student affairs team, feel free to send them to our email address. You could also sign up for the mailing list through Coursera. There's a link there. And once again, just wanted to point out our two MOOCs, which are great ways for those of you that are just hearing about the program and really starting the exploration of MCIT online, a good way to kind of see if this is something that might really um, draw your interest to in something that you might be passionate about. So the Python and Java specialization and the computational thinking course. Um, so you might wanna try those out as well. But once again, thank you for joining us. Um, like I said, we'll stay on and answer more questions for you. And thank you for joining us for our April webinar. And a reminder, our application deadline for regular cycle is May 1st, 2021, 11 to 59 p.m. And our next cycle will be for spring. So we have two cohorts a year, fall and spring. And the spring cohort application term will open this summer. And the early cycle deadline will be September 1st. And the regular cycle deadline will be October 1st. So you could either apply now if you have all of your application materials ready or kind of explore one of the MOOCs or both of the specializations and, and kind of get through those and then apply for next spring. Um, but thank you for joining us. And thank you, Tom and Boone, once again. Thank you, Rafia and Boone. This is my first webinar as director and it was all awesome. great. So thanks Enjoy a lot. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your day. You thank you, everyone. We'll see you in the Q&A tool. <laughs>